Today's episode of Poets at War is sponsored by the following. Hello, I'm Sarah Levesque, Editor-in-Chief of Logo Sophia Magazine. I would like to invite you to explore our Pilgrim's Journal of Life, Love, and Literature, both in visual format and in podcast format. Our goal is to help bridge the gaps between different Christian denominations and traditions. Please visit our website at logosophiamag.com to read or listen to stories, articles, poetry, and more, all for free. We look forward to journeying with you. This time we sit down with the jolly giant Joffrey Swate to talk about, of course, poetry and many other things, including our view of beauty and what it does to us culturally. Won't you join us in the trenches on Poets at War? We've met tangentially a few times through Facebook Messenger and mm-hmm. some other places. I think I might have said hi to you at the last Fight Laugh Feast if you were there. Okay. I'm not sure if you were. Were you there? Uh, the last one I was at was South Dakota. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you weren't with the, the Nashville one then. Uh, how many have there been in Nashville? Well, technically two. There was the one at the soccer complex, which I did not go to. And then there was the one in the big barn hangar like building thing. Uh, so I was at the soccer one. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah that's what I figured. So, um, but yeah, if you, if you were there, you would have known me as the guy who's wearing a uh, top hat, Hawaiian shirt and kilt doing my thing. Uh, <laughs> because I, I like you do, uh, poetry and stuff but i tend to pt barnum it a little bit (laughs) and (laughs) sometimes you know depending on the crowd it it works you know it just depends on the situation but um love me a hawaiian shirt and i saw you in a whole in uh in a hawaiian shirt in at least one of your videos yeah rock that okay i appreciate that yeah it has a the blue one has dragons on it and and um i really like that so it's just uh, you can see with the background i'm into the whole uh take back the rainbow kind of thing that's really important to me um you know i'm not in any kind of social media activist role i just prefer to uh reference the melchizedekian nature of the rainbow in 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 casual conversation and it makes people it piques people's interest you know the warbo in the sky right yep the warbo the fact that joseph's uh coat was uh essentially you know in many ways jacob uh uh not jacob yes jacob putting his um uh bets on the melchizedekian savior (laughs) like a lot of people don't pick up on a lot of those things you know there's there's so many things there um and it's 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 really a symbol of all the gentiles like christ's legal rule over all the gentiles you know um through shem ham and japheth and everything else but i talked a lot about that with jason farley and everything and he's fun to talk to and did saruman come up in that conversation saruman did not come up in that conversation very i mean he may have very briefly but he's an interesting situation but his color changed every time you know the the light changed it was changing it wasn't a constant thing that's the way i've always thought of it but yeah yeah i i I just think he's interesting to bring in bring in that conversation because tolkien is so great at uh oh yeah at um you know just typological and symbolic language Um, Mm -hmm. but i I, i've always sort of disliked that one you know that yeah get get that gandalf was truly white but that you know saruman had this mutable you know because because white really is you know it is all the light right um so uh, yeah i i sort of wish he hadn't done that but it's one of my you know few nitpicks with him yeah it's it there's there's very few that i have i think you know there's the obvious ones people always go after like don't spend all that time describing that one tree you know all that kind of stuff but like i think that's part of the fun depending on how you're doing it i like i like the audiobook for that reason i can just you know go and do stuff and not pay too close attention and then tune back in you know when when something comes up but um yeah another place that we had contact a little while back i don't know if you remember this but um I commented on one of your videos when you were talking about uh, not, not 
Ben Merkel's take on some of the classical education stuff. Yeah. You remember this comment, right? And and I was talking about being raised homeschooled, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, are you familiar with Joe Moorcraft? Yeah, I am. Okay. He was the one who baptized me. Oh, wow. so 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 i'm i'm i've, I've been in random I, i've been in pca rpcna rpc us which is now of course defunct um and some other you know various ones but i've always been kind of in that reformed space oh, yeah. and a lot of the folks kind of you know the whole auburn avenue thing whatever weird i don't think that you know i think if joe it's funny he's getting up there and i know that he still has things with doug and whatever but i think he's almost to the point where he's he's gonna just call the church and see what's up you know as far as that goes and and put that to rest but it's it's one of those things i look at doug and i look at joe right and i and i'm not you know gossiping in any way about this like they have whatever they have and it's been public you know what i mean um and and so to me though joe did the exact same thing same um, same time slash slightly before Doug in certain cases, depending on what you look at, but they set up a Christian school. They set up, you know, this, the, the, this church and this denomination. And I'm not saying they did it individually. I'm saying that, you know, they, they went through the right avenues. I'm not saying anything about that, but Joe's whole, you know, uh, institutions and everything is sort of for, for hyperbole sake empire, you know, came crashing down a few years ago when there was, you know, all kinds of, you know, kerfuffle and everything else. And unfortunately, most of the children in the, that, that I grew up with, you know, I was homeschooled. Most of the children that grew up in that Christian school apostatized. Unfortunately, a lot of my friends who I went to church with. Right. And when I started like watching, um, I started through Apologia, listening to Apologia because it was I was just looking for reform stuff. I think I found them through the Pubcast years ago, and then I found you know the the cr- cross politic before it was even Fight Laugh Feast, right? Uh-huh. Um, and I was listening to them, and I realized that my friend Benjamin Curley, who worked with Adrian Rink at Wretched, um, they worked with marcus Pittman and david shannon right during their time at wretched so i had all these random little connections and things to moscow i mean the reformed world is, has, has been yeah. small over the years yeah. so you know you always have these connections but, but i mean you know moscow is definitely <clears throat> a, a remote outpost it has an enormous right. you know it has enormous sway but most of that sway is outside the reformed world right exactly and and that's something that i've always really liked about it because yeah my family came for they were homeschool rock and rollers you know they would do <laughs> they would do crazy stuff in order to you know get get things across one thing i didn't mention was my dad was um a uh, mobile dj and he raised me in that family business and we danced and the kids followed along and we gave out inflatable prizes for kids parties you know wow. and so like that was a, a whole thing growing up so i've i've learned to not take myself seriously through that yeah yeah and i'm not just talking about myself i'm getting to some questions and stuff uh, things i have for you too but like i'm just giving you a little bit of background because yeah yeah um th- that comment you know i think we locked eyes because i've been trying to figure out for years because i've heard classical school this and classical school that and i'm like well what is it because i was raised old school homeschool right like my parents and a couple other tutors for you know harder subjects right yeah and um basically like I, I couldn't I couldn't really find much of a definition beyond they teach Latin and the <laughs> trivium and you know and whatever else. I'm like, well, I learned Latin and I learned everything that they're saying is in the trivia, you know, trivium, quadrivium, et cetera. And think, so Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go, I want to hear what you said. Well, so, yeah. yeah, I mean I, there's um it's actually there it, it is legitimately difficult to try to find uh definitions and and, and to nail uh, most of those down, but in various camps of what classical Christian education is, uh, the, they'll usually want to define it pedagogically, right? Mm-hmm. Not by content, right? Right. So, you know, and and you know, you you indicated that you knew you were doing a disservice to why well, studied Latin too, right? That doesn't make classical education. Um, but there's a constant tendency uh, to to sort of move in that direction. Oh, well, we're studying Homer, so it's classical. Um, there, you know, so from the the 
camp within classical Christian education that um, began in the 90s, established some of the better known schools. A lot of it was coming out of Moscow. Um, the general approach is a certain interpretation of, uh, of Dorothy Sayers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that the, with, with that outlook, um, classical education becomes, well, there are basically three developmental phases. Okay. And these developmental phases are called grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And of course, you know, every subject has its own grammar, its own logic, its own rhetoric, but we can talk about a grammar phase when the kids are wee little ones and they're really good at memorizing. Right. A logic phase when they're beginning to synthesize. A rhetoric phase when they're beginning to project. Um, and I think there's a lot of worth in that, um, but um, when it goes bad, and I, I don't think it's the best way to go about it, and when it goes bad, uh, the tendency is to uh, actually just avoid synthesization and understanding and true mastery uh, with young kids. Right. right. And to sometimes even not pay attention to the grammar of a subject with older kids. So it can get, it can get a little forced, but I think as long as you don't force it, it works quite well to take that approach. And there's people in the, you know, the free schooling movement, which also is very nebulous and ill-defined, who, you know, take more of a, a Montessori-ish kind of approach. And I, I have found that... <sighs> I, I see issues on both sides with just going completely wild, open and free and not having any sort of discipline, obviously, you know, that's, that's really obvious. We see that in scripture very plainly, but I also see the other side where, and I'm not even thinking from the perspective of bureaucracy tends to corrupt or anything like that. I'm thinking from the perspective of a student who, if I have a rebellious point in my life, I'm going to kick harder if I think the entire, you know, complex of whatever, like, you know, the entirety of, of a, of a, you know, institution is going to come after me than if it's just my mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, and then of course we should consider the frames of our children, but we also shouldn't let that, you know, decide. Oh, for sure. Right. But, you know, you use the word free and I think that's really important. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, I think that there, there are profound problems with things like unschooling, but, mm -hmm. you know, all education must be free. So then the question is, well, who's the authority? And every good Christian school will say the family is the authority. Right. But few Christian schools will live that out. Right. Right. And it's hard to do. Right. Um, and so I think that, you know, you know, there's a classical school here in town, um, that uh has a montessori kindergarten mm -hmm. and it actually jives quite well I think you know montessori can it was founded by a christian woman but you know there's definitely like Rousseau, there's some weird Rousseau, stuff yeah Savage, yeah enlightenment stuff in there which is really problematic particularly as you get older and this is the same problems that you see with unschooling right you mm -hmm. can't just you know, like, I actually grew up very much, you know, like C.S. Lewis describes in Surprised by Joy, his childhood. And now, you know, I mean, he went off with tutors and then and then to schools. Um, but really, his his fundamental education happened because he was stuck in a, in a huge house with lots of books. Right. And that's honestly that that is the, the foundation of my education. That's how I was raised. I was quite isolated, um, but we were a bookish family and I was just always in books. Yep. And um you know, so that's one thing, but it's mm -hmm. another thing to say, you know, do whatever you want, right? Right. There's definitely a little, a little a Rousseau action going on in there, which our perverse hearts will take some really dark places. Well, right. And it, and it goes back to like what you were saying about authority. Like, are the parents the authority or are the children the authority? Right. Right. <laughs> so now, if the school's the authority, that, that creates more the ultimate authority there as far as education goes that creates i think a lot more problems but the person who should never be the authority as a child yeah until he's coming into manhood mm -hmm. right and then that's of course a wisdom thing just like you would do with anything with anything else but i think it's really important i don't know if you know by the way this is my job right uh, okay yeah i wasn't sure if you knew that i, I kind of sort of a tell know, John, tell the listeners John too the Pope, tell okay, tell yeah. the listeners a little bit about it too like i i, oh. I know but i want to hear from yeah. you too so 
I'm the chief academic advisor at uh, Kepler Education. I'm, I also teach there. Uh, but basically, I'm I'm the 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 man who faces the families um, when it comes to Kepler, which is a Christian, an online classical Christian education platform. So we have all these teachers to come in, offer all these classes. Um, but yeah, so you know, we we talk a lot about, and you know, we have a couple of great podcasts, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. But. Uh, um, we talk a lot about about freedom, but uh, you know, just to, to unfortunately quote uh, Spider Man and other greats, right? With great freedom comes great responsibility. But like, you mm-hmm. must have liberty, you must have free education. But then you have to define, you know, what is liberty, right? And, you know, and so in the case of education, liberty is the freedom to do well, the freedom to do what is right in God's eyes. And so we need to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we need to think of education as that. Education right. is raising your kids. There's no right. such thing as math class in a vacuum. You are raising your child. Mm-hmm. And that algebra is not necessary. Neither is poetry. Mm-hmm. Though those are good things. You should do everything you can to have those things. Mm-hmm fundamentally education is dad and mom and child living to the lord yep yep absolutely yeah the, the you know this you know we're talking about the the bookish sort of isolated situation i wasn't so isolated cuz the my my uh, mom and my aunts uh basically were the big pioneers i had told you but i'm telling people again of the homeschool communities in the area we get together at the park you know once a week we do whatever but it wasn't a co-op back then you know co-op has become more of a thing um with my aunt she did teach classes for certain things at her house but it wasn't a co-op you know you just came for classes that you were taking and paid her and whatever else um and she was a professional teacher actually went to school for it and everything else um but the, the 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 bookish thing was always there because my mother's parents owned many, many conservative bookstores. They were part of the uh, Birch Society, you know, back in the day, all that kind of a thing. And oh yeah, they were, (laughs) oh yeah, (laughs) I'm telling you, it's, and it's weird. Like, I'm not sitting here like uh, uh, bragging about any of it. I just want, I want to say this stuff because like, I'm, I am proud of the heritage that my God, God gave me, but I, I feel the responsibility and the weight. And I'm like, Joffrey, help me. Uh, Jason Farley, help me. Like, I see you guys doing the thing that I want to do. Right. What is that thing? Uh, that thing for me is, um, uh, well, I have, I actually have a mission statement on my website. I'm going to pull that up right now just so I can read it verbatim. Um, not something I normally do. I usually go off the top of my head, but I spent all this time on it. And so I want to get it right. Um, give me one second. Let me pull this up here. <sighs> so my mission statement is I am a lay minister and bard of the church. My ministry has an emphasis on teaching fathers, mothers, and children to be their families' bards, encouraging them and supplementally instructing them in what we believe through storytelling, hospitality, and life-shaping entertainment. Wow. I love the use of the word bard. I don't know if I would have the courage to. <laughs> right. Well, that's part of the, that's part of the razzle dazzle. That's part of the, 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 the PT Barnum, you know, yeah, which by the way, great. which by the way, I'm, I'm related to his wife. By oh, are you? <laughs> um yeah, yeah that, someone, someone told me the other day they were they were going to the circus and i actually had a hard time believing them like, right because those... ringling brothers is gone and yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. um well, yeah i was i was at a um a, an event this past saturday uh so you know i know we're going to talk about honey bear house but so honey bear house at their inaugural event it was sort of just a soft launch hey let's get some people together mm-hmm. a bunch of musicians in town who were doing uh, hayden's uh, creation mm-hmm so um you know they came and they performed uh, several pieces in, in this house including a couple of jason farley poems that have been set to music by mark reagan who's a local composer mm-hmm. um and then you know i sort of led a discussion with the group um but the nature of english language poetry i talked about you know the you know so jared manley hopkins had this idea that there you know there are kind of three kinds of rhythm and in english and we sort of unpacked all that we had a you know a grand old time man i need uh, that <laughs> uh, i mentioned uh, so i introduced myself 
it's not the first time I've done this, but I introduced myself as a poet. I said, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Joffrey Swate. I'm a local teacher and poet. Uh, and after the event, we're all hanging out, we're drinking wine, we're eating cheese, we're just enjoying the outdoor weather. And uh, a couple of the guys, you know, they, so one of them just directly asked me, how did it feel to describe yourself as a poet? And it wasn't <laughs> the first time I'd done it, but really it, it is something like to introduce yourself as a poet and not have, say, rainbow colored hair or look right. like you live vegan right. um, is is actually a bold thing to do. That's one of the reasons I use the word bard. Exactly. That's why, <laughs> that's why I'm bringing this up. Because right. you're, you're, you're confronting people, as P.T. Barnum as it may be, you're conf you, you are saying something so ridiculous, you are either a fool or deadly earnest. Right. And you're forcing people to deal with that. Yep. Maybe you're both. Yeah, no, I, I, I the third option. I, and this is the thing with the, with the kids party stuff. Like I, you know, just as an example, this is, this is the show business part of my, my whole makeup. Like when we started DJing together, my dad and I, it was Hawaiian shirts and, and jeans, you know, to most functions. And then occasionally, you know, we'd be doing weddings. So we'd have a tux. My dad actually bought me a tux and bought himself a tux for the business and whatever else. And, um, but the, the thing was like, we did, we ended up doing more kids parties as the years went on than adult parties because adults really don't actually want to party they want to drink and go crazy and whatever else and like kids are more fun um but the i actually was the one who said to my dad as we continue to build these shows and and you know we would create playlists that we would you know audible on the fly we're going to do this dance we're going to do that dance whatever and, and go through the whole thing but i was the one who made the change of uniform to t-shirt with our logo printed on it with all the you know info on it and everything and a, ha a baseball hat uh each of us in a different color with the name uh the our nickname on them so that all these little kids who are looking at these you know yeah. large intimidating men can realize that's happy that's big dog i was big dog my dad was papa bear right and so like they could call us that and it was yeah. like they were in on the joke they were they were there with us 100 percent, and it didn't look the, the more ridiculous you, you look the less ridiculous you look when you start doing something that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. And, you know, and, and, and sometimes, I mean, so what people consider ridiculous is potentially, you know, quite noxious to the spiritual health, right? We mm -hmm. have all these issues of pride and, and it's actually, uh, uh, by the way, I'm a physically ridiculous person. So <laughs> I know I'm, you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, and, 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 so I can't walk down the street without people, you know, talking about it staring at me wow he's tall yeah exactly I'm six how tall nine. are you six foot nine, nine. okay I'm not just six foot nine i'm six foot nine 350 i'm a right. 18 mm -hmm. so actually even even if i'm dressed to the nines i have huge feet even for a man my size right so i could be i could be completely elegant and looking amazing until you hit my feet and then it's clown shoes <laughs> no way around and you know and I, I don't say that people are laughing and giggling mm -hmm. um because you know often it's just like wow and it's impressive and awesome and i am grateful to god for that um uh, but th th there's cer certainly i have had to live my whole life dealing with the fact that i can't just be neutral or just exist people right people will always react to me mm -hmm. so it's been an but i like the effect that that's had i like the effect of having a unique name, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I am actually uncomfortable when I'm expected to be exactly like everyone else. Right. Okay? I've had right. to learn to be comfortable with that. Um, so I've actually sort of made it a priority to, to sort of to raise my kids in a way that, uh, that, that, that forces them to, to be outside their comfort zone as often as possible. And, you know, sometimes it's been a, a bumpy ride. And of course I can't see it, uh, you know, as, as, always necessarily a virtue in itself or being the best way to be, but it's certainly how I, I want my kids to be because I, right, I like what it right. did to me, generally speaking. Um, and, you know, I've been really pleased to see them, that, my, you know, my kids are, you know, go-getters, they're assertive, they think for themselves, they do their own projects, they do their own things. Do a couple of them have my vices of, you know, maybe ignoring wise voices and all that, sure. Um, but uh but you know that's i i actually think that is an important life skill and mm -hmm. that we we often when we're when we're raising our kids when we're thinking about ourselves in the world 
we are too often asking how we fit. Mm -hmm. And behind that is how we fit into systems. Right. right? And, and Christians ask this question. Ultimately, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the sort of thing that a lot of Christians and even Christians ask of homeschoolers, right? Like, like how are right. you going to be socialized? What they mean is, how are you going to learn to stand in line? Because oh, yeah. they can't conceive of any other way of existing. That was constantly something my mom would bring up all the time. It's just so socialization means the school system. It doesn't mean anything else. You right. know? And, and eventually the job system. So it's not right. like there's not, it's not like there's not some benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem is when Christian families are, are seeing this as the ideal or what they're raising their kids to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, the, the last thing you want to do, because ultimately it's satanic, is to raise your kid to be a drone. If mm -hmm. your kid is working in a cubicle at Microsoft, that's absolutely wonderful. Right. But if you raise your kid to be a drone, there is a serious problem. Right. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to move on to another question I had uh, specifically. Um, well, first, why don't you tell us about the Honey Bear House because, uh, and, and that mission statement? Because I said mine. You talked about y'all's event a little bit, but like, uh, Jason talked about it a little bit, but I think um, he he was saying you have more of the vision for it as far as he can tell, and so he wanted he was said talk to Joffrey. So, all right, yeah. Well, H Honey Bear House is a great collaboration. That's the mm -hmm. idea, and we're just getting off the ground. But um, what we want to want to be is you could think of it as a project clearing house or or a matchmaking house, but you know, we we we're focused on the word and actually means small w word mm -hmm. so words communication um and then whatever might roll around that artistic efforts uh social efforts academic efforts one of our first big projects is going to be to open a public library and when i say public i do not mean the states i mean right. the publics mm -hmm. um but you know like we uh we we had this musical event which was poetry set to music we'll we'll, we'll be planning a beowulf conference uh, this fall and we're just going to you know attempt to by god's grace go from strength to strength but the idea is that you know you have a certain project in mind something a collaboration you'd always wanted to do and you know you could really use an illustrator or a musician or someone else to to to, to work with you on that uh, and, and we'd like to to grow to the point where we can help in all sorts of different ways, not only with connecting people, but with finding markets, helping to um, helping to finance, you know, that sort of thing. But it's still it's still baby steps. We want to make sure to always be rooted in locality. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons we, you know, it's the the library project is obviously a multi year project. It'll involve several phases. Um, but you know, we're starting on that right away because we want to be an organization that exists in space. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean we're limited to Moscow. Right, right. now, you know, we, we are. But what, the last thing we want to be is uh, just another online group. Right. And right. maybe maybe one day there will be a Honey Bear Christian Study Center in Austin. Or Augusta, and, Georgia. <laughs> or Augusta, Georgia, say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And who knows, right? And then just m more things. But we always want to make sure that we're actually connected to to the real world right what we're doing so that people oh, okay th those are the it's those guys over there doing those things right not just it's these hobbyists uh and their forums right right so here's a question i have that it dovetailed perfectly into the next thing um <sighs> You know, the, the the big broad question, is poetry marketable? I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do with my poetry and stuff. My stuff is uh, mainly uh, epic stories. I write lyrical poetry. It's not to music or anything specific, although sometimes it is. It's it's more not, um, but it's, it's sort of lyrical, um, not any particular structure, just whatever the, 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 the scene needs. And I do scenes in individual poems and about 10 of them is an episode. So that's about 22 minutes reading it aloud, you know, so it would fit nicely into kind of TV show territory as far as time goes and all that kind of stuff. And I just do things that I love. I do sci-fi, I do fantasy. I would, I'm a big, you know, Tolkien Lewis kid, right? Like my dad grew up reading me Narnia and I want to share the, at least the, um, uh, the spirit of that with as many people as I can as a, uh, as also a way to teach people 
you don't have to just read my stuff, like go and make the stuff for your family. There's this concept of the family stories that has gotten completely lost. You know, people talk about dinner table, this, that, and the other still, but that no one talks about like the stories grandpa would tell you on his knee that he made up himself for you as a gift. Right. Like that's long gone. That's one or two generations gone. My mother did that. And I have Mm -hmm. to admit, I, 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 I haven't carried that on. Mm-hmm. I actually, I, I have, I have difficulty with narratives, right? Uh, or right. perhaps I just haven't put my, uh, my, my pen to it sufficiently. Because, a... because the truth is, I'm not actually a particularly prolific poet, mm-hmm. um, but I've always thought of myself as a poet, and I think that's right, important, yes, right? which is why I was, just, you know, unembarrassed to just, you know, tell that group, and it struck some people like, whoa, whoa, he actually says he's a poet, right? Uh, but I also, I don't take myself too seriously in saying that. Yep. Right. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, I would, I would never, I, I may cook quickly at times. I may cook for convenience on a certain meal. I would never cook in a slapdash fashion. I'm going to cook with care. Right. Uh, and you know, my, uh, the, my time and my passion may dictate how much time I, you know, I can, I can, how, I, how much I can develop in that, but, um, I'm going to do it to the glory of God. And I work with words. I've always worked with words. I'm a teacher. I'm a language teacher. I've, I've always enjoyed poetry. So I've never I've never stopped writing a little. There may be the months though can go by and, right. and I'm not writing on and that doesn't cause me to question, oh, I'm not a poet because I haven't written in months. Right. Or right. I'm not striving to do that either. And, right. And, and you know, so that they there there there's good reason to try to do that and to to try to you know, you, you ask uh, you ask if poetry is 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 marketable. You know, the question then can, can you know is is poetry a, 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 a legitimate full-time vocation uh you know and those are definitely you know th- things that, that we could unpack but that doesn't really define whether you're a poet or not right right um so so yeah i guess i brought up prolificness why did i bring that up oh yeah oh yeah okay well i was actually going to move on to i will prove to you that poetry is marketable mm-hmm. watch this mm-hmm. y'all you should go to Jovial Press's website and buy Well Met Poems of Companionship by Joffrey Swate <laughs> right now. And look forward to later this year the publication of Made in the Image, another a new volume from Canon Press. Ta-da. Mm-hmm. There you so go. Well Love it. Sells. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and then we, we can go back and see if it worked. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that with with uh, with our society the way it is and our church particularly yeah the church the way it is that poetry is marketable now right. you know efforts still need to be made and you know and you know canon is canon press is publishing me they're not a vanity press mm-hmm. um but you know so if they were strictly interested in money they would not publish any poetry right they are interested in developing poetic sensibility and a, right. and a poetic audience mm-hmm. uh and so you know in that sense perhaps uh, a, a poet is a loss leader right mm. like you know the product in costco that they don't make money off of but it's there so right. you walk in the door right right um so you know th- they want to shape a poetic audience uh also of course you know i have a social media following uh you know that makes it easier for them as well to uh, to uh, accept a manuscript from me um but you know there's you know there's never really been a time uh, where anything beyond sustenance was in the reach of poets. Right. Right. Uh, and, and by sustenance, I mean sustaining yourself and, and, and your family. Right. You weren't going to get get rich as a poet. Of course but, not. You know the the idea of patronage is is utterly gone mm-hmm. from from our families, from our businesses, and from the church. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Some churches do a, a better or worse job of, 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 of hiring artists, particularly musicians. Mm-hmm. Right? And the musicians are the easy one to justify to the, the board or the session or whatever. Um, but, you know, you know I, I actually think it's very cool that the Mark Reagan actually has leeway and some budget from Christ Church here in town to do cultural events. Right. Community events. And that's rare. Yes. In, in the church. Uh, but I've, I've seen it before, but it's rare. That's something uh, I'm fighting for in my church currently. Well, it does not exist outside of music. 
Right. right. You might get some hip Kellerite church. Well, we well paintings up. And all I, I will that. say, I will say, yeah, I was going to say our our PCA church, at the very least, uh, and we're conservative PCA has a few people who are like, you know, they actually go to Paris and sell their paintings. You know what I'm saying? And so right. we well, actually. Well, yeah, what I'm talking go ahead. about is actually, I mean, and that's wonderful. What I'm saying, the church actually uh, shows off their stuff, you know, and has events and that sort of a thing. So, yeah. But the church doesn't send them to Paris. Right, exactly. Right? No. <laughs> and, there, and there's another level, which I would like to see. Um, and and your, your church is to be praised for that. You know, but, you know, showing off their stuff is relative, right? Like, right, sure. Somebody into a coffee shop or having a show in the evening is one thing but mm -hmm. actually saying you know what um we know that you dedicate yourself to to visual arts uh we like what you do we want you to do x number of things for us every year and in return we will be a third of your living right we will give you 15 20 25 30 000 a year mm -hmm. we set this aside in the budget you are now an artist for this church right uh, we can't afford to like you know pay for you and your family to to live upon this green earth right but we can certainly contribute to it in a big way we're going to do it no you know no one no church would ever think of doing of having an artist in residence or right or anything like that i say no church i'm sure you could find an example somewhere but oh sure not, sure it's not a part of our system right we don't right think in terms of patronage and in my opinion that is the best way for the arts to flourish. Mm -hmm. Modern arts have c condemned that system because it's the sort of system where I mean, like the the Hayden, you know, the Hayden concert that happened uh, that happened this past Sunday. Um, I mean, he, Hayden was 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 uh, under a duke who mm -hmm. paid his living, um, and he he wrote a lot of pieces. And then a couple of them were performed in the Honey Bear house show on Saturday. He wrote a lot of pieces that were just like, I'm the Duke. I pay your salary and I play the cello. I want pieces to practice with in the evening. Right. Right. So I'm your patron. Produce some, some stuff I can just play in the evening myself. Right. And instead of seeing that as an opportunity, not only to produce those pieces of art, but to have the freedom to then develop more things and, and you know, bring more vision out. Instead, the modern art world sees that as so repressive. Right. Right. Which is absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. I'm a huge fan of the patronage system. Yep. Yep. Well, the, that leads me to, um, I, okay. So, one of the big people that I look up to, you know, regardless of some of his earlier theology, he became more Calvinistic later on before his life uh, finished is uh, Rich Mullins. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people like Rich Mullins. The Rabbit Room people really like Rich Mullins. He yeah, tends to kind of me, yeah. he, he tends to kind of circle in certain artistic, you know, and Christian I groups. The, I, the only thing of his I really liked was that demo tape that came out right after he died my deliverer is coming yes, yeah yeah so, so good. Yeah. good but all the other stuff is just so ccm -O -O. well you haven't dug in honestly okay. there's some okay. unbelievable okay. You, need, you need to hit me later well let, let, i'll give you just a just a touch off the top of my head from the place where morning gathers you can look sometimes forever till you see what time may never know how the lord takes by its corners this whole world and shakes us forward and shakes us free to run wild with the hope that this thirst will not last long but it'll soon drown in a song not sung in vain i he feel the thunder in the sky i see the sky about to rain and with the prairies i am calling out your name mm. i mean <laughs> that is beautiful and strong but i will tell you <laughs> yeah that if it was veiled in in ccm stylings which I oh yeah was oh yeah for sure <laughs> i would really struggle with it i mean oh for sure that's just yeah. the reality. Well, you can read Rich Mullins instead of listen yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but I mean, like that's really what, like I, it was such a revelation to me, having you know, sort of heard him in the background of my life for a couple of years when I was very young, uh, and sort of dismissing him, and then someone insisting that I listen to this demo tape that was just him mm -hmm. and the guitar. Some of it's a little more developed than that, but it was. And, and I, it's, it's not. I don't think that this is somehow like a work of superior genius to his other stuff. Right. Right. I just think it was presented in a way 
that I could, that where it could really resonate with you. Yeah. 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 Well with him, he had a, a, a very interesting life. There's, there's one very accurate movie about him, which the, I can only imagine actually stole plot points that didn't in from that movie that didn't actually happen to the mercy me guy, which is very strange. Um, but, uh, actually happened to rich. And, um, basically the, the point I'm trying to get at is he, Nashville was his patron because it was his job, but he never wanted the job. He actually got his demo tape sent in by a friend and he was trying to not do that because he had this weird fascination with St. Francis and some hippie version of asceticism at the time. Right. And so basically like he ran away from it, but God made it clear that's what he was going to do. And as he, you know, progressed and became a a bigger talent as first as a songwriter and for Amy Grant and other people. And then as a musician, um, he, he gave he basically said i don't want to have anything to do with the money i know i'm set i'm going to give 100 percent of my money to the church and i want them to give me whatever like the average salary of whatever yeah. you know person is and he was able to bless his church that way and then go from there you know um while i think some of that is kind of crazy you know and he did some crazy things and asceticism is weird and not at all something I'm into. One of the things that I've made really clear on what I do is I will take any and all gifts, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but everything I do is free. My stories are free, et cetera. And the reason for that is, is because I want my, I don't want anyone who comes to my stuff thinking that they can make money on some kind of model, right? And, and, and I want them to focus on creating stories for their children to hand down to them Mm -hmm. and curating stories and poetry and beautiful things that they can hand down to their children. My father, his, his main thing was music, being a DJ, everything else. But he actually would like sit down and talk to me about the differences between Bach and Beethoven, like as a music class, he would talk to me, you know, about their lives and their stories and all the kinds of other stuff. And he loved everything from, uh, you know, Pink Floyd and Rush and yes. And he loved progressive rock back in the seventies and stuff. And he still loved it for a long time to new age, to classical, to, you know, Celtic music. He was really into the Gettys before he passed away in 2020. Um, but like that, love transferred over to me and the one thing i can remember well two i'll say two things one all of narnia because he read all all of narnia to me multiple times um and then the other one which well let me let me back up narnia when he passed away i actually had the privilege the absolute privilege of reading the last chapters of the last battle to him in his final days oh man so i (laughs) so i i don't know if you've ever seen that it was years ago but i did a video that was a challenge mm-hmm. to read the last battle without crying. <laughs> it's impossible. Like, like, yeah. Well, I mean, and with your father in his deathbed, like I can yeah. do it like in my, you know, in my living room with air conditioning on. Oh, I was a mess, oh, but yeah. you know, it was a privilege, man. It really, really was. Um, and you know, the, the thing that got me the most was when they get, you know, through the gates and you've seen a couple people already, but like, uh, one of the big first ones to welcome them is Rupichi. Yeah, you know that that one always gets me. <laughs> always, always gets me. Reepy Cheap made it. Yeah, he he made it. Excited, but you are. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, and and the other one that was so big was the wedding at Cana. I'll never forget the big like there weren't a ton of times where my dad actually sat down and taught a class it was more my mom but that's because he worked but when he did you know it was a special time and we we try i tried to give him all deference and listen to him he was more like school minded in the whole thing than my mom she was a little more you know open and whatever but he he was very earnest in what he wanted to teach me and so wedding of cana I remember him saying very specifically and driving home expositionally, everything else. This was a veteran wine taster at this situation who had tasted the best wines from all over. And he immediately said, what the heck are you doing? This is the best wine I've ever tasted. Right. And he said, God didn't just turn water into wine. He didn't just keep the party going. Like, you know, some people use use that as their, their final point. He actually turned the water into 
the best wine. Probably the best wine that has ever been tasted on planet Earth. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the ramifications <laughs> of that for aesthetic value mm -hmm. are, are massive. I mean, that, 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 that tells you that excellence is real. And if right. you have opinions about beauty, you are crippled. Right. Because Jesus made the best wine. And one of the ways that he rules... Just functional. Yeah, and for one of the ways he rules in a, you know, to use Jason Farley's word that he's been knocking home and knocks unplugged lately, legal sense. One of the ways that he rules in a legal sense is he wins the rap battle. He wins the aesthetic battle every single time, right? Yes. He is the king that has absolutely unlimited resources and can give the best gifts to literally everyone. And what, 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 a, what a problem it is for the Christian church, the American church, but particularly the Reformed church, that we'll, we'll look at things through the lens of truth. We will occasionally look through things through the lens of goodness. We never look at the world through the lens of beauty. And so we lack, in fact, people aren't willing to believe you when you say you can look at something and tell if it's true or good. Right. You can, you can have such a, a well-developed sense of beauty that you can have the ability to apprehend the nature of something. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this is within our power. And, yes, and it just is. Just like anything else. I mean, you know, logic is fallible. Our perception of the truth fails. So it's not like, hey, listen, if you read enough poetry, you're going to be able to walk around and, 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 <laughs> and, and be a new Adam. Right. Right. It, it's not that, but, th right. but this is real. It is as real as studying to be able to seek out the truth. Right. If you study beauty and you, you dedicate yourself to beauty, you can look at things and, and judge them. Yes. And, and this is one of those things that um, I constantly go back to with, you know, I, the podcast guys and Jason and you and some others have, um, I, I've always been, savvy to this growing up i always saw that there were problems but i could never fully articulate them and in the past uh i don't know especially the past five years probably the past 10 years i've been developing that sense of understanding why it is we do, we as calvinists who believe absolutely everything is predestined you know etc cetera, etc cetera, like um why we sit there and go why, why we don't go the fa the fabric of reality is littered with the happy ending <laughs> you know what i'm saying why we don't actually look at reality and 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 make judgments based upon that and this is coming from a kid who grew up with uh my main apologetic being vantillion Right. But it was straight from Van Til, which is a little bit different than, you know, some of the people who came after him, you know, and yeah. and whatever else. Um, the but I don't think they're opposed. And I think the people in both camps are constantly talking over one another. Well, you I, know, I think that in, in reform circles, there's a uh, a historic um, problem of trust there's a lack of trust we don't trust ourselves because we don't trust jesus right and the thing that frightens us the most as we don't trust ourselves in jesus is beauty is the sensual mm, right yeah we believe we can defend ourselves from from lies right we believe that we can defend ourselves uh, from high-handed sin Mm -hmm. the truth and goodness side of things but we we don't think we can defend ourselves from delight right right and the seduction there and, right you know and, and of course like you know we we we, are, we know that we're not just talking about uh you know a a proverbs proverbial whore we're right. not just talking about we're, we're talking about all, you know, all these little sensual things that can drag us down, but we fail. Uh, but be because of that, like it's we we underdevelop that moral ability, right? Um, and we fall prey to the sins 
on, on the on the other sides, right? Just like so many other Christians, our tradition is is out of balance. Right? Mm-hmm. I'm a Presbyterian for a reason. I think right. it's the best to be Presbyterian, mm-hmm. but that is a serious lack on the Presbyterian side. Right. Something something that uh, the Anglicans and Lutherans do better than us. Even the Catholics do it better at times, oh, yeah, you know, do. in certain circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and, and they're way out of whack on, on in some other areas. And oh, yeah. Orthodox. Mm-hmm. But they both outperform. Uh, everyone outperforms a reformed in the arts. Everybody. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and ultimately, I would connect it. And this is where I would connect to uh, to papism and, uh, and, and the Orthodox churches. But um, it, it comes down to, I, I think, sacramental theology. And I don't, yeah. I don't necessarily want to unpack all of that, but I, I, I do just want to put out there that we, because we have tradition-wide an underdeveloped sense of beauty, uh, we're blind, we bump into the things that we shouldn't bump into, we fall into holes that we shouldn't fall into, and we fail to proclaim the gospel the way we ought to. Yes. So you said that the happy ending, the good ending, it's everywhere, and all we can bring to people is a, su- a superior systematic theology. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and that's supposed to, to bring the unbeliever in. Sometimes yeah. it does. Right. But for us to think that that's preferable right. to telling a good tale. Right. And, and, and the fact is, you can distill a systematic theology into a serial poem. You know, you can make it beautiful, like doing it as a systematic theology. Like that's, that's great. I'm not knocking it, whatever. Like there's scholarly works that are meant to be dry for the purpose of organization. Uh, But organization has completely trumped, you know, beauty and, and um, beauty is the strongest apologetic we really have. As Christians, it back absolutely, and it touches back on what we were talking about early. Like we we all sort of opened our conversation with the uh, concept of of ridiculousness, right? Mm. And I, I we we are proud. Yeah, and we're too we're too proud to allow people to think that we think flowers are pretty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well, we can wrap up here in just a minute. Um, I wanted to uh, talk with you a moment about my lore project that I've talked about with Jason and them just very briefly, um, give you a sense of one of my epic poems that I'm working on actually turning into a lore project. Um, And uh, we'll go from there, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the actual recorded you know gonna go out to youtube part everyone be your family's bar do not turn to the right or to the left and the lord will be with you wherever we go we'll see you next time in the trenches on poets at war song everyone thank you god of song said the warrior part the old world betray the one sword at least i right shall guard one faithful heart shall pray